Um, next week, just to let you know what's happening, um, we're going to um, wrap up this first part of this series. So it's uh, a series within a series, a mini-series. And so to do that, um, I'm going to be interviewing our very own quantum physicist. Um, that's Glenn Batchelor. And um, we're going to be talk well, Glenn's going to be talking about the fine-tuning of this universe as evidence for intelligent design. So I'm really looking forward to that. And for that to happen, Kelly has graciously agreed to swap. So Kelly will be preaching um, the following Sunday, and I'll be looking forward to that as well. So um, in your Bibles, if you would turn to Psalm 139. And we're going to read from verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my un unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. Before one of them came to be, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Let's pray. Father, help us to see um, in this particular topic this morning the vastness of your thoughts towards us. That we, in fact, are not here by accident or by chance, that we are here by design that you thought of us before you created this earth and you continue to think about us and work your blessing and your favour and your purpose in our life moment by moment until what you have deemed to accomplish in us you will bring to fulfilment on the day of Jesus. So that's what our declaration is this morning, that's what our hope is. But as we look at the contra view of life, help us to do that again with grace and understanding and with clarity of thought and a determination to not allow this particular view of life to pervade our thoughts or the thoughts of our children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or the generations to come so that this world might stand in awe of the Creator God who loves us and sustains us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was a photon who was um, checking through the security part of the airport and the security uh, agent said to him, any baggage to declare, sir? And the photon, photon said, no, I'm travelling light. It gets worse. <laughs> said one DNA to the other, do these genes make me look fat? Light travels faster than sound and that's why some people appear bright until you hear them speak. <laughs> no one in this room, of course. A man once said to God, God, how long is a million years to you? And God said, it's just like a second. And the man said, well, how much is a million dollars to you? And God said, it's just like a penny. So the man said to God, can I have a penny? And God said, just wait a sec. starting to warm up. I thought you'd be warm already. When I was in high school, uh, one of the subjects that I elected to do in senior in year 11 and 12 was biology. And the, the biology textbook that we had was called the Web of Life. It was a big thick sucker. And I remember the day that school finished, year, year 12, the first thing I did was get rid of that book because I'd carted it around for two years and it was heavy. It's actually two volumes. And I remember quite clearly that the web of life was very much um, underpinned by Darwin's theory of evolution, um, not just the theory, but also the mechanics of the development of life from a biological perspective. Now, not much has changed because through the week, I took the opportunity to search for the curriculum um, that has been delivered in our local um, state schools. And I actually discovered that at um, Gympie State High School, 
the curriculum, a part of the curriculum in science is um, evolution, the theory, but also the mechanics. So um, it's still taught in our schools today. And if you do a cursory search of texts that are in universities, um, for instance, I did one for Sunshine Coast University, again, you'll find that in the science texts, there is the, um, the predisposition to evolution as an assumed worldview. So, this morning I want to speak about the evolution revolution because in the last 30 or 40 years, some of the aspects of evolution that were assumed for a long time have been seriously challenged because of scientists' capacity to explore our Earth, our world, in a way that they haven't been able to before. And of course you would understand that with the increase of technology, for instance, the electron microscope, which allows you to see things that you would never have seen without that as technology, all of that to say that the evolutionary theory and some of its fundamentals have been seriously challenged. In fact, the, the, the onus now would seem to be on people who hold to an evolutionary worldview either from a philosophical point of view or a scientific point of view, the onus would seem to be on them to prove that. Now that's actually a reversal in the last 30 or 40 years, but here is here's the tragedy. At, at least um, at secondary level and at tertiary level, it is still declared as the almost default world view for, that explains the beginning of and the development of life. So that's why I've called this the evolution revolution, because you have this juxtaposition of the scientists saying, hang on a minute, we need to challenge this. And these are not just creation scientists. These are not just the people that we would say are, are in our court, if you could put it that way. But these are people who um, till now have held an evolutionary viewpoint and are now challenging it. So, um, just a quick recap, in 19, in, and so I want to look at evolution from a, from a mechanical sci scientific point of view, um, but also from a philosophical political point of view. Now, I know this is hard going, right? And, and I just do appreciate the fact that you can hang in. And if it's any consolation, it's hard going for me. Last week I read, I referred to Stephen Hawking's view on the beginning of the world as a combination of both um, general relativity, and you'll remember the theory of general relativity, don't you? That generally everything is relative. <laughs> the more relatives, the more wealth, you know, that, that sort of thing. No. Um, his was a combination of general relativity and quantum theory. So I felt that if I was going to quote that, I must do my due diligence. I actually read that paper. It's hard going. It's, uh, it's about two and a half thousand words of really, really intense reading. It's hard going because he jumps from one analogy to another, from one word picture to another. So I appreciate this is hard going, but there's a reason for it. Okay. So just to recap, in 1859, Charles Darwin wrote, On the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favoured races in a struggle for life. Now, if you, if you picked up a book that had that title, you'd put it down straight away because you think half the content of the book's just in the title. And there's two critical aspects to Darwin's theory. One is this, that all biological life has a common ancestry, bacteria, trees, animals, and humans. So he, he held that all life form had a common ancestry. The second aspect to it is this, that life as we see it now is in a continual process of growth and development by means of natural selection um, of the favoured species. So what he's saying is this, that the favoured species will survive, it's the survival of the fittest, other species will die out, and in this tree of life that we'll explore shortly, um, the species that are favoured, the species that can survive in the conditions will emerge. So they're the two fundamental aspects of um, Darwin's theory. 
So we're going to talk about the four-legged stool. And um, if you've ever read Lee Strobel's book, The Case for a Creator, in chapter three, he speaks about four icons of evolutionary theory. And we're going to, I'm just going to beg your indulgence, and we're going to speak about those just briefly. If you want um, a more in-depth discussion of that, I recommend that you read that book because it's, it's, it's an excellent read. So I'm just using his framework, but I'm using different references to the ones that he has referenced, different scientists. So, the four-legged stool. The, the, <laughs> the first leg of, let's go back. These icons of evolution, four icons, are actually what holds the weight of evolution in terms of both a philosophical standpoint and also scientific. Number one is the primordial soup. Now, the theory of the primordial soup, and you may have heard this before, is this, that the early Earth had a reducing atmosphere, and this atmosphere had gases that were favourable when they came into contact with different kinds of energy these gases and the energy that they were in contact with were favourable for the development of the basic building blocks of life, amino acids. And the thought is this, that these amino acids would gather together in, in little pools, either on the, the shore of an ocean or a pond somewhere, or, as it happens, in a can of Campbell's soup. And you, can't, you probably can't see it, but that, there's a can of Campbell's primordial soup. Now, many of us have had occasion, haven't we, to indicate to the waiter that there's a fly in our soup, but this is taking that theory to a whole new dimension. So in order to, to prove whether this is actually true or not, and by the way, those amino acids were called, the, the early ones were called monomers, they were very, very basic forms of life, and they were meant to develop into polymers, more complex um, organisms in a process of evolution. So in order to prove this, a man called Stanley Miller set up an experiment. And he combined what he thought were the early gases of the atmosphere with a constant source of artificial energy. And in fact, over, over a couple of days, he did develop some basic amino acids. There's a number of problems with this experiment. One is this, that he stacked the experiment by using gases which most scientists would say were not part of the early Earth's atmosphere. For instance, he had more methane than oxygen. In fact, he didn't have any oxygen at all in his composition. So he stacked the experiment so that he could actually derive at an outcome. The second problem with it is this, that um, the byproduct, as well as forming some basic amino acids, the byproduct was um, some toxic gases like formaldehyde, and as I've mentioned previously, formaldehyde is not a long lost relative. Formaldehyde is actually embalming fluid, and also cyanide. The other dimension, the, the other problem with this experiment is that um, he himself, and, and this is, you, you recognize this is a major problem. He himself understood that the, the water that developed or the soup that developed would not sustain ongoing life past those very basic monomer amino acids. In other words, the water wouldn't allow for a chain of molecules to develop, which is prerequisite for um, uh, well-developed organisms or highly developed organisms. Now he himself actually distanced himself from this experiment but in an ironic way what he proves is closer to intelligent design than it is to evolution because he was an intelligent man who established, who set up this apparatus and actually produced something. Now I don't think he ever intended that but historians would say this is now a footnote um, in the history of evolution, and what he did, ironically, he's actually pointing towards intelligent design. And so there's a couple of quotes here. A major portion of the reaction products were no closer 
to life than the contents of coal tar. And that's by Klaus Dos. And as you know, we all need a good dose of Klaus. And then the second quote is this, the usually conceived notion that life emerged from an oceanic soup of organic chemicals is a most implausible hypothesis. And that was written by Walter Bradley and he's written a book called The Mystery of Life. And again, if you want to read chapter three and four for a little bit of quiet time devotional reading, feel free. If you're bamboozled, I was too, but that's the conclusion that he came to. The second leg or the second iconic image is Darwin's tree of life. So Darwin's tree of life is his depiction of how everything has a common ancestral source. And um, what you don't see in this picture is there's actually, when he first drew this picture, he wrote the words, I think, and then he drew this picture. Now for Darwin's tree of life to in fact have any capacity to explain life at any level and also the sophisticated level that we have, there would have to be a continuation of evidence or what we would call transitional fossils. So if Darwin is right and we all developed from one ancestral source, then there would be a historical path which is embedded in fossil evidence to prove that. For instance, if elephants developed from horses, you would think that there would be fossil evidence to show that an elephant, uh, that, a, that a horse in a transitional stage, not just an intermediate, but many transitional stages developed into an elephant. The problem for Darwin's tree of life is this. And again, you need to do the research, okay? Don't just believe me. The problem is this, there is no such transitional fossil record of those organisms in those stages of development. The evidence is not there. In fact, Darwin said when he drew this and when he espoused his theory of evolution, he said himself, this depends very much on the evidence being found post him, right? So he, he passed away and since then the evidence hasn't been found. But however, prior to Darwin, the evidence that was found in the fossil record in what's called the Cambrian explosion, where you have fossilized remains of nearly all of the major phyla, genus, species, and groupings of animals in one strata of rock. And uh, if you ever want to, again, dig a bit deeper, <laughs> no pun intended, but it's, it's called the Cambrian explosion, and these fossils were found in Cambrian rock, in Wales, actually, and the Cambrian explosion was a real dilemma for Darwin. In fact, it was called Darwin's Dilemma. He looked at it and he said, I, I, I don't know. And when you look at the Cambrian explosion, it would almost be as if someone, an intelligent designer, once said, let the land produce trees and vegetation of every kind, each within its own kind, and each with its own capacity to reproduce. Let the land produce animals, each according to their own kind, and each with their capacity to reproduce. I, I wonder who may have said that. Any ideas? So Darwin had major, major trouble with the Cambrian explosion. However, we don't really because the flood would actually account for the sudden compression of nearly all of the phyla, the grouping species genus in a strata of rock. Darwin had a problem with it, but we don't really have a problem with the so-called Cambrian explosion. You with me? Okay. Number three, the ascent of man. This is actually not... <laughs> 
Look, any, any similarities that are drawn here with some of you guys is just coincidental. It's not... Uh, The Ascent of Man, you've seen this, haven't you, in, in books somewhere, and this is, as a, again, this is not the scientific Ascent of Man, this is the doctored version. And the Ascent of Man is this, and, and obviously this is an extension of Darwin's theory, that mankind developed from, from apes to primitive man, um, through stages of development to what we now have as modern man. Now, all of this theory rests on the discovery of what we know as the missing link. And so, there was a, a little bit of background here, there was a German scientist called Ernst Haeckel, and he had a student, a Dutch student, called Dubois, that was his surname. That sounds very French to me. I, I, I don't think he was Dutch, but perhaps he was. And Haeckel had this view that if we were going to find fossilised remains that would point towards the development of man through these stages, then they would be found in the East Indies or what is now Indonesia. So Dubois went to the island of Java. He was the first man who was funded to excavate and find fossils. And when he was on the island of Java, on the Solo River, S-O-L-O, he found a skull, a cranium, or bits of a skull. He found a tooth, and a year later, he found a femur. Now, his theory was this, that this was actually fossilised evidence for the missing link, and he called this man Homo erectus. So, he's somewhere there in a the transition to modern man. Now, Dubois took his findings back to Europe, but people weren't very warm or accommodating of his theory. In fact, the professor of his professor, who is the, the father of um, modern pathology, said that the skull belonged to a big gibbon, a big, you know, a gibbon, you know what a gibbon is, right? An ape, a monkey. And, um, and he wasn't sure about the femur. So Dubois took his femur bat and his skull ball and he went home and he didn't want to play science anymore for about 20 years and any time that anyone questioned his finding in fact he wouldn't let even he wouldn't even let people examine the bones and when he was pressed or when he was criticized he became very very defensive and agitated now in 1907 75 scientists went back to this excavation site they dug up 10,000 cubic meters of earth. They filled 43 crates full of fossilized remains. They went back to Europe. They were closely examined only to find that the femur bone that was found a year after the skull was in fact the femur bone of modern man. So the problem with the ascent of man is that no one has ever yet found the missing link. Although I think I've met a few people who are close, but no one has ever found, and you might say that about me. So, And so the last leg in the stool is um, Haeckel's embryos. Now this German scientist, Ernst Haeckel, had this thought that um, evolution was supported by the view that the beginning and early embryonic stage of different animals, humans, salamanders, pigs, rabbits, cows, there was a startling similarity to embryos. Now, what history tells us is that his drawings were actually doctored, and we would call them fake. He used similar templates to draw embryos from different animals and just name them differently. Um, he didn't draw the very, very early stages of embryos. So we would now say, and science, and in fact, there's, 
there is currently an outrage amongst evolutionary scientists, not creation scientists, there's an outrage amongst evolutionary scientists about the fact that Haeckel's drawings still appear in biology and science texts as fact. So there you go. There's our four-legged stool. It's looking very dodgy, isn't it? The question is, why, 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 Delilah? Why is it that if, if science and modern science is really, really challenging the theory of evolution, why is it that it still appears and why is the uptake of evolutionary science, theory and mechanics still as virulent as it has been since the mid-1800s? And the, the answer is this, it's a very... So the basic question is this, why do people believe in evolution? And here's the answer. Because they want to. Because they want to. Because if the science is seriously challenging at least, let's just say at least, aspects of evolutionary science, theory and philosophy, why is it that people still believe it? And the simple answer is because they want to. There was an atheist and his um, name is Aldous Huxley. And in a moment of honesty, he said this. He said, I didn't want the world to have purpose. So I assumed, I assumed the world didn't have purpose and then I found reasons to back up my assumption or evidence to back up my assumption that the world didn't have a purpose. And, and when we really get to, you know, why, why would anyone be proud that their great ancestor is a monkey? I mean, who would be proud of that? Actually, in a famous debate, um, just trying to think of the, the man's name. He debated, um, anyway, I forget the facts, but um, not long after Darwin brought out his theory, who was the man that was responsible for the emancipation of slavery in England? It's a politician. Wilberforce. Wilberforce, in a famous debate, there was Wilberforce and a number of other scientists. And in this debate, Wilberforce said to now, I forget the scientist, it was an atheist that he was debating. He said to this person, now, um, from which side of the family did you, know, did you develop from the monkeys? Was it your grandmother's side or your grandfather's side? And the whole debate just descended into mirth and hysteria. Actually, Wilberforce didn't do himself any favours. But, but why is it that someone would take any sense of pride at all about, being dis about coming from the apes or the monkeys? I mean... And he, here is here's the answer to that question. It's a very, very simple answer. The reason people want to believe in evolution is that it appeals to the most fundamental rebellion that we have in our hearts and minds against God, which is the rebellion or the sin of pride. Because if you can, if you can look down the line of evolutionary chains of development, and if you can say, look how far we've come. Look how far we've risen above the bacteria, above the fish, above the animals of the field, above the monkeys and the apes and the gibbons. Look how far we have come. Aren't we good and we've done all of that without God? The reason people believe in evolution is that they actually want to believe in evolution despite the evidence and you must also remember the trajectory of evolution is not just to man as the apex of the species but the trajectory of evolution goes beyond man and it holds out hope for a wonderful destiny of mankind because if we've come this far over millions of years imagine where we can go so the reason people believe in evolution is not scientific at all, it's an issue, a matter of the heart. Because the heart of man is deceitful and wicked above all else, and the heart of man in its natural state stands opposed to the sovereignty of God. 
Okay. I want to just talk about Charles Darwin for a minute or two, and then I'm going to wrap up. Charles Darwin is an interesting man to research. He was born in a Christian home. His parents were Christians, and as a boy, he was very devout. He read his Bible. He prayed. Um, from all accounts, he was a Christian, a strong Christian boy. But Charles Darwin, when he was a lad, was spoilt. And the reason he was spoilt was this. He was spoilt in his thinking. The reason he was spoilt was that his father was fabulously wealthy. And Charles Darwin realized that one day he would inherit this wealth. And so he became very unmotivated to work or to study. He had two attempts at study, at higher learning. One was that he studied to be a medical doctor and he failed. And then his father urged him to study theology towards becoming ordained in ministry in the Church of England, which he did. And he studied at Cambridge. He majored in theology. However, while all of this is happening, and by the way, he scraped through. He did get his degree in theology. But while all of this is happening, there is this fascination emerging in his life for nature. So while he was meant to be studying theology, he was out collecting beetles. Now, I can't be critical of him because there were times when I was meant to be in a theology lecture and I was actually playing table tennis. So far be it from me, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. But there was this emergence of interest in nature. While he was at Cambridge, he fell out of good company, fell into bad company, and ironically, thinking that his father was wealthy and he would inherit this wealth, he was deeply in debt. What he didn't realise that his father would actually pay the debt. And uh, so he had to get out of debt, he had to earn money, and he took on a job as a naturalist on the ship, the Beagle. Now the Beagle was only meant to be at sea for two years, in fact it was at sea for five years, and it was out there charting, exploring, um, all that sort of thing, but Charles Darwin was on land, including the Galapagos Islands, taking notes, 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 observing, and it's the basis of his notes that formed his book, The Origin of the Species. In the process of this, he moved from a man who had strong faith in God to a point where he was agnostic at best. But there were two things that bothered him about what he observed. One was the function of earthworms. He looked at how earthworms functioned and he couldn't reconcile that with his emerging evolutionary ideal. And the other thing is he couldn't reconcile that with the human eye. He looked at the human eye and all of its intricacy and, and thought, this has got to be the result of a creator. This, this can't be evolution. And we would all say, yep, looks like the eyes have it. Someone's still awake. <laughs> he was a conflicted man. Emotionally and spiritually, he was deeply conflicted, which actually manifests itself in a very unhealthy body. He was always covered in boils and sores. He was always suffering with a whole array of illnesses. He married a Christian lady and they had a whole brood of children. I think they had about nine children, nine or ten. I lost count when I was going through his genealogy. You know? No, not there. <laughs> and he had a wonderful Christian wife and she would constantly say to him, my greatest fear is that because we have a separate world view, we will be separated in eternity. Now, it would be a brave man to condemn Charles Darwin because of the fact that he had a wonderful praying wife. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. But Charles Darwin is the typical profile of a man who is on the run from his father his earthly father, because his earthly father made no bones about his disappointments with his failures in his study. And he's a typical profile of the man who's on the run 
from God. And that's his story. That's the backstory to Charles Darwin. His father paid his debt. He married. He had children. He suffered terribly with illness. And there's a common myth in Christian circles that he actually recanted from his theory of evolution. That didn't happen. What happened was this, that on his deathbed, the Duke of Argyll came to see him and he said to Charles Darwin, when you look at nature, and he brought to his attention the papers that he had written on earthworms, the human eye, and he said to him, when you see all of this, doesn't it make you believe that there's a creator? And these were Charles Darwin's actual words. He said, sometimes it seems that way to me, but then it just goes away. And as far as we know, he died an agnostic. And there's a profile of a man who's on the run from his father, seeking approval from his father, and on the run from God. He's like a modern day Jonah. His best friend, a man called Adam Sedgwick, wrote this about the origin of the species. He said, from first to last, it's a dish of rank materialism, cleverly cooked up. And why is this done? For no other reason, I'm sure, to make us independent of a creator. And then he said these words, Charles Darwin's theory is going to cause brutalization in the century to come. It was an amazing prophetic word. He said the extension of this theory will cause brutalization of the human race in the century to come. So what happened was this. Ernst Haeckel, Haeckel a German, influenced thinking and philosophy in, German, in Germany. Haeckel was a disciple of Darwin. And he influenced um, the thinking of German people. Not, not only German people, but specifically German people. So there is a direct link. Now, I know this is controversial, but there is a direct link from Charles Darwin to Haeckel to Adolf Hitler. Because if you'll remember, what Adolf Hitler wanted to do was this. Adolf Hitler wanted to rid the Aryan gene pool of anything that would potentially contaminate it, which led to the murder of six million Jewish people, untold gypsies, and Hitler also had a very, very negative view of people with any Negroid in them, um, which was very embarrassing for him because um, in 1936, Jesse Owens won four, <laughs> won four gold medals at the Olympics, and uh, it was very hard for Hitler to explain how um, people of, you know, um, Negroid descent were inferior <laughs> in the face of that. But there is a direct link from Darwin to Adolf Hitler. In fact, Adolf Hitler's biography, autobiography, is called. Mein Kampf, K-U-M-P-H, which means my struggle. And in that, um, all through his biography is references to his struggle running parallel with the struggle for survival, which is endemic in the evolutionary theory. The Bible said when God created, he made it good. He didn't create it as a struggle between species. The Bible says that we didn't emerge from the apes, that we have one common ancestor as mankind, and that man is Adam. And from Adam, God made all people of all nations, right? So <laughs> you and I have got everything in common with people from all nations. You can marry someone from any nation of the world. You can marry someone from Nigeria. You can marry someone from Holland. Believe it or not, you can marry someone from Ecuador, you can marry someone, you can marry anyone, your chromosomes will match. You can donate blood to anyone who has a similar type blood to you. 
you can learn the language of other nations. It's not easy. I remember once trying to learn Japanese. I actually went to TAFE College to learn Japanese. Karen knows this story. It's very funny. I learned Japanese for 12 weeks at a TAFE College because I was um, frequenting um, ha Hamilton Island and taking services and there's a lot of Japanese people there. So I'm living truth to the reality that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing because I remember one time I was in an elevator full of Japanese people and I sprouted out the one line of Japanese that I actually knew. I got it out quickly and fluently but what I didn't account for was the fact that they would actually start dialoguing back with me. See they thought I was fluent in Japanese. I had nothing. I just fell silent and I pressed the next floor, you know, the, the button. <laughs> I've got to get out of this elevator. You can learn the language of the nations of the world because that's the way God has made us. And that's the truth. Charles Darwin also had a very close relationship with Karl Marx. And so what Adam Sedgwick said was true, that this theory of evolution would lead to the brutalization of humanity in the century to come. Now, I'm going to lead you into prayer. And here's the focus of my prayer. All of those four icons of evolution are still in texts today. And my, I suppose my great fear is this, that I've got grandchildren, you've got grandchildren, great-grandchildren, children who are going to school and who are learning that evolution is the default position, the default theory of life, the beginning of life and the development of life. But it's the philosophical and political ramifications of that that we need to be very, very aware of. It's still endemic today. It's still endemic today. It's there in business. Survival of the fittest. A company will buy small companies, absorb them into their company, mega companies. It is still there and endemic. So I know it's been another long haul but I want to finish in a prayer and I just want you to stand with me as we pray and, um, and we really do need to pray. Let's stand together and pray. Father, this morning we just simply affirm that we believe that your word is true. We believe that your word is tells us in simple straightforward language how this world came to be. We believe that with that your word tells us that that you created with your spoken word that everything that we see around us which science actually does confirm that everything that we see came about because you spoke it. We also affirm Lord that in your scheme of things, mankind is very, very important. That you made us just a little lower than the angels, but you have set us apart from the plant world and the animal world, and you've created this environment that we live in, which we understand is a, is a privileged planet, so that we could live, so that we could explore, but above all, so that we could worship you as creator and as our saviour. So all of this truth we affirm this morning. But we also understand that our world doesn't necessarily affirm this. That our world will continually attack and undermine and for reasons that are all distilled right down to the pride of the heart of man. And so we pray that we would have the capacity as your children to continue to walk humbly before you, that we would have the wisdom and capacity to instruct our children and our children's children through the generations to come that our Lord God is the creator of our planet, of our universe, who holds all things and sustains all things. And then one last thought, Lord, one last prayer is this that where we have the opportunity to engage with people around what is their fundamental worldview, 
that we would be able to do that with some skill, with a lot of humility, and that by your grace we would direct people to you. And so that's our corporate prayer this morning. And we pray that in the name of Jesus.